Welcome. My name is Julianne Koss, and I'll be your host today on The Complete Picture. Today's episode will focus on some creative retouching techniques, as well as adding textures and edge effects to completely change the look and feel of an image. We're going to start with this straight image of a magnolia taken in my friend's garden and finished with a much softer, more pleasing image. Now, I realize that some might suggest that the following effects be done using more of a traditional method. However, I personally feel that using Photoshop gives me so much more flexibility in my creative process that it's, it's simply just a better tool for me. In this case, we're not fixing the image in Photoshop. We're actually going to create it. So let's start by talking about what it is that we need to retouch in this image. When I look at an image and before I ever start retouching it, I just want to step back for a minute and take a look at what are the distracting elements. Is there anything in this image that, that doesn't belong or that isn't really necessary? And, and I can find a lot of things. For one, this was originally a film image and so I can see all of these little problems here. We've got some dust down here and over here. So I'll need to remove those. But then this little corner area right here where this one part of the petal is overlapping another and we can see through to the background, that's just kind of distracting. There's no reason for that to be there. So I would take that out. Likewise, down here in the lower right, I would take out this dark area and this dark area up here in the upper right as well. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in to 100%. I'll start in the upper left-hand corner here and I'm going to grab the healing brush. Now, you can use the spot healing brush, that's fine. I just am kind of a control freak, and so I use the healing brush tool so that I can tell Photoshop exactly where I want it to sample the information from. And I'm going to make a few changes in my options bar. I'm going to change the hardness of my brush. I'm going to actually make it a soft edge brush. I find that it blends well this way. Other people like the hard edge brush, so completely up to you. I am going to turn on the aligned option. Let me show you the difference. I'm going to hold down my Option or my Alt key to set a sample point right here, and then I'll draw or paint over the spot there to remove it. Now, if I move to another spot, you'll notice that my source has remained in the same place. It's always going to go back to that area where I first Option or Alt clicked. And I actually prefer it to work a different way. I prefer it to be aligned. Watch the difference here. I'm going to Option or Alt click and then I'll paint in order to get rid of that spot. And then when I move around my image to remove additional spots, you'll notice that my source point actually moves with me. So that's just a personal preference. It's the way that I like to work and it's just the way I set it up. So do whatever works better for you. And then I'm just going to go through this image very quickly. And sometimes I'll need to change that point but not very often, especially not in an image like this where really there aren't that many differences. Like it's not like it's a really detailed image here. But if I get to a place like uh, on the edge of something or if my source point actually goes off the image, then obviously I'll need to make some changes. All right, so I'll just focus in here for a moment on the center of the flower, scoot down, and I think there's a few more right down here. All right, so I'm just going through the entire image and I start in the upper left and then sometimes I do what I'm doing now, which is just use the space bar in order to move down a little bit on my screen or I can actually use some keyboard shortcuts. I can use the page up and the page down shortcut in order to move up or down an entire screen. I can also add the command key to the page up or the page down and then I can move left or right, which can be quite convenient because when I see a lot of beginners retouching, they'll start in one spot, but then a lot of times they're overlapping the same areas and sometimes they skip other areas. So when I don't want that to happen, I use the page up and page down. This is a pretty easy image to retouch because it's not very large, so I can just move up and down using the space bar to give me the hand tool temporarily, and I know that I'm still going to be covering all of the areas. All right, so we just have a little bit more here to remove. Okay, so typically I'll go through at 100% and get rid of all the dust or scratches or dust from the sensor, and then I'll zoom out 
twice so that I'm at 50%. And I'll just look at the image again to see if there's any areas that I missed, like kind of bigger spots that I might want to go and fix. For example, right down here. See all these little dark pieces? It, it looks like the pollen has actually gotten there and then it's been smudged in. So let's go ahead and fix that. Now, when I get up near the edge, I'm going to get in a little bit of trouble. What typically will happen is something like this. See how the edge of this flower, where it's lighter, the edge of the petal has now smeared into the bottom one. So in order to avoid that, I'll actually change from the healing brush to the patch tool. Then I'll drag around the spot, but I'm not going to get too, too close to the edge there. I don't want to overlap it. I don't want to make my selection go into the edge. I just want to stay close to the edge, but I don't want to cross it. And then I've got my patch set to the source. So wherever I click and drag that marquee, it's going to grab the information from where I release the mouse and patch that area with it. So I think that's looking better. We've still got a little bit of a problem there. That might be a little too close. Nope, that did a great job. Okay, and maybe right here I've got another little spot. Excellent, so that is looking good. Let's go ahead and zoom out so we're looking at the whole image. All right, so I've got all my dust and scratches removed. I've got any spots removed, and now it's time to kind of tackle the bigger areas. Now, I want to do this in a flexible way because if I mess up, I'd like to go back. So let's go select my lasso tool. And what I want to do is I want to fix this area here. So I draw a big selection around that area, and then I move that marquee somewhere else to where there's like good information that I can use in order to cover up this other information. So let's go ahead and jump that information to its own layer. I'm making a copy of it here so I can use the keyboard shortcut Command J or Control J and that gives me layer one here and you can't tell but that information is on layer one so let's grab our move tool and just scoot that up a bit. Now obviously that doesn't look very good. We'll zoom in you can totally tell where I've just covered that up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a mask to layer one, but I'm going to add an, an all black mask because I don't want to be able to see this area. What I want to do is I want to see the original and then paint with white just in the areas that I need to retouch. Let me show you what I mean. I'll hold down the option key and click on the mask icon. That would be the alt key on Windows and see how I get a black mask which means that it's hiding everything on that layer, which is great because then I can see everything on the layers underneath it. Now all I need to do is grab my paintbrush, so I tap the B key on the keyboard. My brush is a little bit big, so let's go ahead and use my left bracket key. That's going to get a little bit smaller of a brush. See, so the right bracket key gives me a bigger brush, left bracket gives me a smaller brush. And now I'm going to paint not with black, but I want to paint with white. So I'll tap the X key to exchange the foreground and background colors, and then I'm just going to paint. And what am I painting with? Well, I was painting with 40% opacity. That's good, actually, because then I can slowly build up the paint there, which is slowly showing me the contents on this layer. Right? So there's before and there's after. And that's blending really well. All right. Let's move on to this area down here in the lower right. This is a big area. I'm going to want to make sure that I grab a ton of extra information from somewhere. So if I want to get a feel for how big of an area I need, you know, I don't want to make my selection really small like this and say, well, that's the area that I need to cover up. What I want to do is say, hey, you know what? This is the area that I want to cover up. That whole big area. And then I'll move the marquee, just the marching ants, to a different area in my image, return back down to the background in order to steal some information, and use Command-J or Control-J to jump that to its own layer. Now, let's reposition that down to the lower right-hand corner. Obviously, it's not fitting in yet, so we'll do the same technique we did a minute ago. Option or Alt-click on the mask icon, and that's going to give me an all-black mask. I'll grab my paintbrush, and, you know, I'm going to change some of the settings here because even though I can paint with 40% opacity, that's going to be the most amount that I can paint with. So the, the hardest stroke on my pressure sensitive tablet will still only be 40% opacity. And I personally would rather have the hardest stroke on my, my Wacom tablet be 100%. So what I'll do is I'll set the opacity up to 100 and then come over here and click on this icon which will show my brushes. 
and I'll make sure that my shape dynamics are not turned on. I'm going to turn those off and my other dynamics, I want those turned on to pen pressure. So now when I press lightly with the tablet or with the pen here on the tablet, it's going to give me maybe 10 or 15 percent. The harder I press, the more opacity, which is just great when you're working with these masks because I know that down here in this corner, I want to completely show the content, right? So I'll press hard there. But then as I want that content to blend in, I'm going to press lighter. And I've got a rather large brush here, right? And the reason that it's large is because I wanted that nice soft edge. Okay, we'll just blend in like this. Let me zoom out one. Okay, and I'm going to blend a little bit more right there and maybe even a little here. Now I've gone too far and I can see the edge. I'm not sure if you can see that or not, but see how I can see the edge of the, the area that I grabbed. So I'm going to tap the X key that exchanged my foreground and background color. And that way I can just paint that out. All right, Command-0 or Control-0 zooms me out all the way. And the thing is, is that this is a little bit too light for me. So it'd be nice to just darken down that area a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a Curves Adjustment Layer, but I want to clip it because I only want the Curves Adjustment Layer to affect Layer 2. And if I just add a Curves Adjustment Layer by using the icon down there at the bottom of the Layers Palette, you can see that everything changes, and that's not what I wanted. So I'm going to hold down the Option key, or the Alt key on Windows, when I select the Curves Adjustment Layer. And what that does is it brings up the New Layer dialog box which is perfect because this is where I can choose to use the previous layer as a clipping mask. So watch what happens now. When I click OK and I change the curve, see how only that bottom area is changing? Brilliant. This is exactly what I want. I just want to make that bottom area just a little bit darker. Now I think that's too dark because I don't actually mind that there's a little bit of lightness here. It almost looks like you know the light's coming down and this is obviously casting the shadow right underneath it. So I'm going to leave it like that. It's an adjustment layer, of course, so I can turn it on, turn it off. I can also set its blend mode to luminosity, which can be very helpful because when you make an adjustment with curves, sometimes you get increased or decreased saturation depending on the adjustment. And I don't want any change in color here. What I want to do is just shift the brightness down a bit. So I'll choose luminosity as my blend mode. All right, let's move up here to the upper right. And I'm going to grab my lasso tool again. This, again, is a really large area. And I don't think I even want this petal showing here. So let's say we just come over here and grab a ton of information. I'll go back to the background layer, Command-J or Control-J to move that to its own layer, and then use my Move tool. We'll just scoot that over right about here. Hold down the Option or the Alt key. Click on the mask to hide all the contents of that layer. Grab my paintbrush and we'll start painting it in if we're painting with white. So let's tap X to exchange so that white is now my foreground color. And now let's paint this back in. All right, and I'm going to paint all the way down to here. And there'll be some overspray, but that's okay because I'm going to remove that in just a minute, like on this lower, lower leaf. It's just easier for me to, to paint it in here. And I'm not sure that I really like this little white line here, but I'm going to remove that in just a minute. So I'll get that painted in, and then I'll tap the X key, and I'm just going to follow this line right here to make sure that it looks like this is actually back behind there. I can follow that line. That was a little too much, so we'll undo that, and just like that. Okay, now the problem is, is that I, I don't like this area up here because, one, it, it kind of looks like it's repetitive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up this image. I'm actually going to transform it so that this area right here is taking up this entire space. You have to be a little careful when you do this. Like, If I was working on someone's face or something, I really wouldn't want to scale up or down very much because in this case there's a lot of grain in the image, but if there was noise from the digital camera and you're, you're stretching it and transforming it, the noise is going to get bigger or smaller. But I'm actually going to knock that whole background out of focus, so it's not as big of a deal to me. Plus, I'll show you a little technique for adding noise to kind of get it to all look similar across the whole image. So let's do this first. Let's unlink the mask from the image because the mask is in the right spot. I, I like what I've done there, but I need to transform the image. So we'll click the link icon in between them. 
Then I'll click on the photo or the thumbnail for the image in the Layers palette and then use Command T or Control T to free transform this. And I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit so that I can access the top of my transformation handles and see how I'm just going to pull those out a little bit so that there's nothing distracting up here in the upper right. I'll tap the Enter key and that will apply that transformation. Now I do want to look at the mask for a minute because I see that it's a little bit splotchy up here and I don't know if that's the original or if it's the way that I've used this brush in the mask. So I'm going to hold down the Option key and click on the mask icon and I can see that there's some levels of gray here still in my mask. So now what I'm going to do is while I'm viewing the mask I'm just going to paint out those little subtle levels of gray. And then we'll turn on the eye icon and that will let us see the image again. Okay, I always like to go back and check my masks. In fact, I should go back and check the other two as well. I'll just Option or Alt click on it. Just want to make sure that there's no hard edge here and Option and Alt click on this one up here just to make sure there aren't any hard edges. This is especially important when you're compositing images in my opinion because a lot of times if you have multiple images and they're overlapping sometimes it's hard to see that you actually have a hard edge mask in there that you need to get rid of. What I think I want to do is blur the edges. So if I want to do that in a, a real flexible manner it would probably be best if I used a smart object because then I could use a smart filter. So let's do that. Let's convert this to a smart object. I can choose layer, smart object, convert to smart object, or if I don't want to use the menus, just right mouse click next to the layer and choose convert to smart object. Now it's a smart object, so if I were to add, for example, the Gaussian blur filter, and let's set that to maybe 16 pixels and click OK, we can see that we now have a smart filter because on the layers palette, because it's a smart object, I now have a smart filter which I can turn on or off totally non-destructive. I could also change the opacity or the blend options by double clicking on the icon to the right. So if I wanted to put it in a different blend mode or change the opacity here, no problem. Or I can go in and modify or change the amount of blur by just double clicking where it says Gaussian blur. And if I decide, you know what, this really looks better at about 11 pixels or maybe it looks better at 50 pixels, totally up to you. I'm going to leave it around 20 and click OK. But the problem is, is that the whole image is blurred. And what I really wanted were just the outer edges blurred. But that's okay because, look at your layers palette, you have a mask that automatically appears when you have a smart filter. So I'm going to click on that mask to target it. I'll grab my gradient tool by tapping the G key. And I'm going to select the second gradient here, which is the radial gradient. And I want to hide the Gaussian blur in the center. So black is going to hide, so I will exchange my foreground and background color so that the center of my radial gradient is black. Black will hide the blur, and then I'll click and drag out towards the edge. And when I release the mouse, we can see that the center is in focus. I have hidden the Gaussian blur, but that blur is certainly around the edges of my image. Let's zoom in a little bit. I just want to make sure that enough of this center area is in fact sharp, and it is. So I'm very happy with the blur, but do you notice what happens? See how the center, because it's sharp, see, we can see the noise there, but as you move out towards the edge of the image, there's no longer any noise or any grain in this case because it was an original that was shot on film and then scanned. So what I would like to do is add back in some noise on the outer areas of my image. I know there's many, many different ways that you can do this, but I personally like to do it, again, using smart objects just because of their flexibility. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer at this point, and I will rename it Grain, and I'm going to fill that with 50% gray. So I'll use the Shift-Delete keyboard shortcut or Shift-Backspace on Windows, and for my contents, I'm going to fill with 50% gray. Now that fills the whole thing with 50% gray. Well, I better hide that because I don't really want to see the 50% gray. So I'll change the blend mode here from normal to either overlay or soft light. Overlay is going to give me a little more contrast in my noise. Soft light is just going to give me really soft noise. So I'm going to add the soft light 
blend mode to my grain layer. And all of that gray goes away, but obviously we don't see any noise here. So we need to add the noise. But before I do that, I want to make this into a smart object because if I make it into a smart object, I can scale my grain or scale the noise up or down as needed. So let me right mouse click and choose convert to smart object. And now I can go to filter, noise, and then add noise. Now I probably want to make sure that it's monochromatic. I just want gray noise here. I don't want colored noise. And then I can use the amount slider to add as much or as little noise as I want. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the outer area of the image and I'm trying to get the size of the noise to match the original noise on the inside. So I can toggle on and off the preview in order to see this. And I think that's about right. It could probably be a little smaller. Let's try around 12. All right, that's looking good. I'm only at 50% though, so I might want to use the keyboard shortcut Command Plus to zoom in and just check and make sure that I've got just about the same amount of noise in both areas. All right, as soon as I like it, I'll click OK. So let's just zoom out. And now the problem is, is that I've added grain or noise over the entire image, and I don't really want that. What I want is the noise to appear in the blurred area, but not necessarily in the center because there was already noise there to begin with. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to use the same mask that I used down here on the Gaussian Blur Smart Filter. So what I'm going to do is on the Add Noise Smart Filter, I'm going to click on the mask and just drag it to the trash can to throw it away. And then I'll hold down the Option key or the Alt key on Windows and drag the Smart Filter mask from the Gaussian Blur up to the Add Noise. So I've basically just duplicated that mask. And the reason that I duplicated it was because I held down the Option key. And if I want to see what this would look like before and after I added this gradient mask here, all I need to do is hold down my Shift key and click inside the mask. And that will temporarily disable the mask. If I hold down the Shift key and click again, we can see it with the mask. So basically, I've just told Photoshop to only show me the grain that I've added in this outer area of my image. And that is making up, of course, for the fact that the Gaussian blur in the layer below it blurred out all of that noise around the edges. So now it looks a lot more natural. Now, it's a little bit too colorful for me. I need to just tone down the greens and the yellows a little bit. So I'm going to add another adjustment layer. Bottom of the layers palette, I will use the adjustment layer icon. And I will choose the black and white adjustment layer. And I can leave it at the default, or I can go through and see what some of these different filters would look like. I actually like the green filter. It seems to be lightening the entire image, kind of giving it a little bit of a glow. So I'll go ahead and click OK. But I don't want to remove all of the color, so I'm going to pull back a little bit on the black and white adjustment layer by decreasing the opacity. Now, I'm going to tap the V key, which will give me the Move tool, and then tap maybe the 8 key, which will decrease the black and white opacity to 80%. And the reason that I had to, to tap the Move tool or the V key to get me the Move tool was because I was using the gradient. And you'll notice if I have the gradient tool selected and I tap 8, it will change the opacity of the tool. That's not what I wanted. So I'm going to tap 0. That will go back up to 100. Then I'll grab the Move tool. And since the Move tool doesn't have an opacity option up here in the Options bar, it's going to change the opacity on the Layers palette. So now I can just start typing maybe 6. I think 60% there looks pretty good. If I type 4, I'm getting a little bit more color back in there, which I think I like, but maybe somewhere between there, maybe around 5 or 50%. That looks really good to me. And I do want to add a little bit of color in this background area, so I'm going to add another adjustment layer. This time I'm going to add hue and saturation. I'm going to click Colorize, and I'm going to pick the hue that I want, which is just a little bit kind of a yellow sepia, really decrease the saturation, click OK. But, of course, that is getting rid of all the color that I just worked so hard to get right here in the center. So I'll grab my gradient tool again by tapping the G key, make sure that I have the radial gradient. It's set to 100% opacity. I want to hide the hue saturation, the colorization right here in this area. So I'll make sure that black is my foreground color because black will always hide and click and drag up to the upper left. So now we see the middle in color, and then we see this very slight kind of yellowish colorization around the edges. 
And of course, I can go back in there and change that at any time by just double clicking on the icon for hue saturation if I wanted to increase or decrease the amount of color there. All right, so I like that a little bit better. Click OK. Let's take a step back for a minute and look at the image. OK, it's looking really good. At this point, what I would like to do is probably, well, what I should probably do is save the file, right? So I'll do a quick save as, and I'm going to put a capital L after my file, so underscore capital L. That tells me that this is my layered file. And I'm going to save it to the desktop in my work in progress. And let's save this as a Photoshop file. Perfect. Click Save. OK. And now I'm all set. So I've got this image, and I've got it the way I like it. It has grown a bit. It was 13 megs to start with. It's now 63 megs. And I want to add some more layers to it. Like I want to add um, an edge effect. So what might be best at this point is maybe to flatten this image and then move into the other document where the edge is. Because that's just going to keep my file size down a little bit, and it's going to help me you know, work a little bit faster. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and flatten the image. Okay, because remember, I've saved this. I can always come back to it. We're going to go over to Bridge, and I'm going to grab this edge file. But before I open it, I already know that it's at the wrong orientation. So why don't I use the little icon up here in Bridge to rotate it? That way, when it's open in Photoshop, the first thing Photoshop will do is automatically rotate it for me. So I'll double click on it. It opens it up, and it rotates it. But because I'm in this mode right here, this maximize screen mode, I can only see the one image. So let's look at them both by going to Window, Arrange, and then we'll just tile them vertically. So now we can see both of them. And I want to drag the magnolia into the edge file. So I'll click on it to make it the active layer. And I can drag from the image or I can drag from the layers palette. So I'll just click and drag on the layer, hold down the shift key, and that will drag and drop it right on top in the center of the edge. So now I no longer need the Magnolia open. I'll close it, but I'm not going to save the changes because, remember, I had just saved this as multiple layers, so then I flattened it, and I don't want to save the flat version. I want to save those multiple layers. So I'm going to click Don't Save, tap the F key. That'll take us back into full screen mode. You can see I have my edges on the background. Well, it'd be nice if the edges were on top of the photograph, so let's change the background into a layer, and I'll just double click on it. We'll call it Edge. Hit the Enter or the Return key, and then I'm going to drag the edge on top of layer one, so it's on top of the magnolia. Now, this is actually a, it's a Polaroid transfer, and you can see there was the picture that I actually made the, the transfer from. But what I want to do is I want to cut out the center portion of this so that we can see the magnolia underneath it. I think the easiest way to do that would just be to grab the polygon lasso tool and just click in an edge. And then we'll scoot over to the other side, scoot down to the bottom, scoot over and back up. And you can either double click or when you position the, any of the lasso tools over the starting point, you get a little icon with a circle and then that tells you that you can close the selection. So the only thing is that's a hard edge selection. And I know I don't want a hard edge, but I don't know exactly how soft an edge I want either. So I think the best bet at this point would just to be to add the layer mask. Although if I click the mask icon right now, it's going to keep the center and get rid of the rest of the image, which is exactly the opposite of what I want. So I'll hold down the Option or the Alt key and then click on the icon. And now I get a mask that basically cuts out that photograph, but it leaves me the edges. But see the sharp, sharp edge here? I don't like that. So I need to blur the mask in order to make that edge less sharp. So I'll choose Filter and then Blur and Gaussian Blur. And let's see what 20 pixels look like. It's a little bit too much over here because I can see now the, the edge. There's just too much of a fade. So let's start pulling that down. Maybe towards, maybe about four will be good. And of course, I can always go in and paint in my mask if I figure out that it's not quite at the right spot. So let's go up to about 10. See what that looks like. Okay, 10 is looking good, but I'm going to need to adjust the mask over here on this side. So I'm going to grab my paintbrush and use the left bracket to get a little bit smaller of a brush and maybe set the opacity down to, I don't know, about 50%. And 
the reason that I'm using the opacity here as opposed to just pressing differently with the tablet is because I'm actually going to click once right up here at the top of the mask and then I'm going to hold down the shift key and click and drag and I might need to do that multiple times now it still doesn't look quite right and that's because the edges they're not blending very well with the layer so I'm going to ignore the mask for a moment and I'm going to see how I can get the photograph or the transferred edges to actually blend better and the way to do that would be to use a blend mode here on the layers palette so let's change this to multiply you can see now I'm getting a little bit better of an edge effect but we can see the image all the way around which I don't really want so let's make a duplicate of this layer command J that'll make a copy of it and then I'm going to set this one back to normal but now we're back to the solid white up here well, I don't really want that I'd like a little bit of my image to come through up there at the top as well as around the edges so let's change the opacity of this layer down just a wee bit till we start seeing some of the color from the image and of course if I wanted to do this selectively I could go in and maybe set my brush to like 20 percent or paint really lightly with a large brush in the mask for this layer and I'd be painting with black and I would just be hiding a little bit more of that layer up here at the top because often when you're doing the Polaroid transfers or when, when I did them traditionally you know you kind of get a little bit of, of spillage over there when you, when you bring the chemicals through so now I could increase the the opacity of this layer a lot more but I'm still getting like a little bit of leftover chemical up there and a little bit of the image that you can see at the top there are two other things that typically happen when you make a Polaroid transfer, at least traditionally, and that is you, you lose a lot of saturation in the image. But we've already decreased the saturation of this image quite a bit. However, if we wanted to, we could add another hue saturation adjustment layer. And maybe just pull down the saturation a bit. I'm not going to pull down too much, though, because we did that in the Magnolia image itself. There just isn't a lot of color in this one. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK just taking it down a wee bit. The other thing that happens, and, and what we can see here and what, what's making this image not blend, is that there is a texture in the scan of the, the original Polaroid transfer. You can see that paper texture, and we're not seeing that texture in the image itself. So I'd like to add a texture across the image as well as across the background. And just like when you're adding noise, there are a million different ways that you can add a texture. But the way that I prefer to do it is by actually scanning different pieces of paper and then using them with the texturizer filter. So I'm going to go back to layer one, which is the original Magnolia, and I'm going to add the texture to this layer. But I probably don't want to make this a permanent change, so let's convert layer one into a smart object. Once it's a smart object, then I can go up here to filter, come down to texture, and then choose texturizer. I'll get the entire filter gallery here and I want to see my whole image so let's use this option to come to fit in view so now I can see the whole thing and we can see there's been a texture applied to it and that texture is listed right here so I've got the sandstone texture there's other textures that you can choose from there's a brick there's a burlap texture and there's a canvas texture but what I notice a lot of times is that you can see a little bit of a repeating pattern in these textures. So what I like to do, like I said, is I scan in a paper texture and then you can use this little arrow right here to load a texture. So I'm going to navigate to my folder here and I'm going to grab a scan of paper, click load, and you can see that texture being applied. Now this is kind of a little bit of a creepy texture in my opinion but we can change the scaling so we can make the the paper texture larger or smaller you have to be a little careful when you make the scaling smaller sometimes you can see a repeating pattern so let's see yep see right down here I can see the edge of the paper where it starts repeating again so you have to be a little bit careful if you scale your image less than hundred percent or if the scan that you made was smaller than the image that you're trying to apply that texture to you can also change the relief of the texture so this is how you would add contrast and make that texture even more apparent so you can see you can really make that that texture pop that to me is a little bit too much but I'm gonna leave it while we look at the different angles 
You can see here that I can change basically where the light is coming from and you can get some really, really different effects here. So I think I'll leave it set to the top here and just pull back on that relief. Let's decrease that number a bit and let's go look at some other papers. I'll click load texture. We can look at paper two. This one, we're going to need to increase the relief, but it's kind of more, more crackly as a paper and I, I don't like that one as much. So let's look at paper three. This one I like, it's a little bit more like kind of a watercolor or a toothy paper, but again, it's got kind of these bigger divots in it that I don't really like. So let's try paper four. I think this is kind of the mildest, meaning it's, it's got a lot of texture, but there's nothing in it that's really gonna interrupt. And if we just bring the relief down a little bit, I think we will find a really pleasing paper texture. So before I exit out of here, let's just see what this looks like at actual pixels. I think I really like that texture. I got a few little spots in here where I might want to go and edit the scan or the photograph of the paper and just remove those so that I don't get that um, over and over as I apply this texture to different images. So now this is looking much more like an actual Polaroid transfer where you would have the texture from the paper that you transferred the Polaroid substrate onto. Because we set this up in the manner that we did and layer one here, the magnolia, is a smart object, one of the unique things you can do with a smart object, of course, is replace its contents. So once you've created an image like this, this will work as like a template. So if I right mouse click on layer one and say replace contents, I could navigate to my desktop and I could go and grab another image and place it and it would actually replace the original image. Now this is a little bit too small so I would need to scale it a bit but that's okay because when I go into free transform I can just pull that up a bit and you know I might distort it a bit because this image is at a different aspect ratio and I want to make sure that the whole jacket fits and I don't think anyone's going to notice if I distort this 3.6%. Alright, so then I'll tap enter or return and I have just swapped out a different image. This one, I would definitely increase the decrease in saturation to make that a little bit softer. But I think you get the point. Once we've, we've created this effect for one image, it's very easy to go in and recreate that effect for another image. Alright, I'm going to go back to history and we're just going to go back in time a little bit to when I add the texture over this magnolia because I do think that the magnolia, the image itself kind of suits this effect a little bit better than that shirt did that was hanging on the wall. All right, we have completed this image and that wraps up this technique for taking a straight photograph and making it into a softer, more delicate and hopefully timeless image. I think you'll agree with me that in this episode of The Complete Picture, we have in fact made a completely different picture. I hope you'll join me again next time right here on Adobe TV.